Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria. The Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth. Young adults and professionals. Titled Recharge to Excel. December 27, 2022. At all 600 hours GMT. All broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms. With Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Almighty God, we bless your name. We thank you for how you are leading us and what you have been teaching us since we came. Thank you for all your ministers, the preachers of the word, bringing your word unto us. Thank you for the call again to let our light shine. And we are praying, O oh Lord, that everything it takes, that our light will shine, the light will really shine in Jesus' name. We pray that on every campus where we have come from, that this light will shine brightly. And there will be no doubt as to what our lives' purposes are. To be that we want to lead people to know the Lord and people to stay remain with the Lord. Open our eyes now as we see this figure, personality, this character in the Bible. And we're praying that you will impress upon our heart the things you want us to know so that we too will become an example to other people. A model who will lift up the standard for others to see. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. This morning, the teaching of the word will center on a New Testament character. And it's a New Testament character that most people know. And it's a New Testament character that everybody will like to agree with. And also like to pattern your life after. To be difficult to find that we can have a large congregation like this and uh, there will not be people that answer to the name of the person we are talking about today. I couldn't do that yesterday. I couldn't uh, tell you to tell me if your name is Absalom, raise up your hand. Because I was sure not to get any response at all. Because we have found out that although the name Absalom was a very good name, Absalom, the father of peace, and there is even a, you know, a, a united kind of effort wanting to bring peace into all the world. And you will think that taking after the United Nations, almost every tribe will like to name at least one child Absalom being the founder and the father, the source, the originator of peace. That is what the name signifies. And yet, if I asked you here, maybe I should ask you, how many of you have the name Absalom? Can you raise up your hand? You see it now? Nobody likes to use that name. The face was good, but the heart was bad. The name was very good, but the character was evil. And therefore, nobody likes to have the name Absalom. But today, I come on good ground. How many of you answer to the name Paul? <laughs> now, I mean, normally, the name by which they know you is Paul. Not just that you like to be like Paul. I like to be like Paul too, but I wasn't given that name. Uh, if you are real Paul, I mean in name, can you raise up your hand? Nobody? OK, 
Okay, they are out. Thank you very much. God bless you. Now the rest of us, whose names are not directly Paul, we can have the nature. We can have the character. We can have the calling. We can have the service. And that's the person we're talking about today. And there is confusion in many quarters concerning Paul. The reason there is a confusion about his life and about uh, what he did and whether we can do the same thing is that there are many people that feel that Paul was a very strong character. That is, they tell us that even before he became a Christian, he was a militant man of strong constitution and conviction. And so they feel it is not just that that man came to Christ and his life turned around. It was that that man himself in constitution, originally in conviction, in purpose of life, he, he had a special build. And therefore many people feel, why should I read about his life? and try to pattern my life after his life. After all, he was Paul, and he was strong, and I am so and so, and I am weak. That's the reason we still we need to look at some references of the Bible, so that we find out, is it possible that this Paul will be a good example, a model, and throw a, a challenge at us that we can follow in first timothy chapter one first timothy chapter one reading from verse one paul an apostle of jesus christ by the commandment of god our savior and lord jesus christ which is our hope verse 12 i paul is still talking thank christ jesus our lord who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Verse 16, how be it? For this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Here is what you need for a pattern, for a pattern, for a pattern. To them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Here Paul the apostle was saying, and he said it by the Spirit of God, that many people will look at my life and they will classify me in a separate group, compartment, all alone by myself. And they will tell themselves, we can't follow him. We can't be like him. We can't pattern our lives after him. He cannot be a model. He lived in a special area, and he lived in a special era, and he did a special thing, and he was called into something that the ordinary fellow will not be called to. And Paul the Apostle said, no, I was called out of the world into the kingdom of God. I was translated from the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of his dear son i was removed from the way i was following before to come into a new way why to be an isolated individual that nobody can follow that nobody can pattern his life after he said no for a pattern to them we should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting some sisters will read about paul Oh, and they will say he was a man. And he lived in a special world that is only made for some special men. I'm just a lady. And because I'm just a lady, how could you expect me to get anything from the life of Paul, a man, and then pattern my life after him? For a pattern to them, which should hereafter believe. That means if you're a believer, whether you're a brother or you are a sister, if after Paul, hereafter, believe, you have now believed, then he is a pattern unto you. And you are going to have a lot of challenges from the life of Paul the Apostle. And I pray it will not be too late for you. Uh, you know, there are people that pick up challenges too late. Too late. And, uh, you know, they hear it for the first time. 
They don't even want to touch it. They hear it for the second time. They don't want to think about it. They hear it for the third time. And they now begin to think, maybe there is something in this thing. And then after hearing it for the sixth time, at the eleventh hour, when their life is almost coming to an end, they say, maybe I need to think about this thing very seriously. And too late, they take up the challenge. Um, it's like uh, when I was in uh, the university, and uh, I don't know what happened to this man. I think uh, he took up the challenge too late uh, in the class. And the majority of us were in our early 20s. And this man, obviously, he could be a daddy to a few of us. And he was uh, there in the class. And he had done uh, his um, O level, A level, many, many years before. Before we even finished primary school, he had finished his uh, O level, A level. And he didn't think he wanted to do any other thing. And uh, then he looked at the papers and then saw the advertisement that now you can apply. And he decided at old age that he wanted to apply. And there we were. And uh, the lecturer will come to the class and put all those things. It was at the time when uh, modern mass uh, was uh, in vogue. And uh, the algebra was so new to him, not like what he did in the, in the A-level. And uh, the lecturer will talk and write and do everything. And our old man will just be looking at the board like this. And then when we finished uh, the class, he'll come to me because uh, all the other people, if you went to them, they'll be saying, old man, what are you doing here? But he knew because I was born again, I was a Christian, and he knew I wouldn't uh, call him old man. He'll come privately to me and say, come. This thing that this man was saying in the class. Do you get tail or head or middle of it? And then I will get him aside and begin to explain all over to him. And then you'll say, now I see. But uh, you only saw it for that day. The second day was still going to come to me again. <laughs> Old man. <laughs> you see, there are some people that take uh, the challenge too late. Uh, but uh, eventually, you know, it's uh, a pity. Even that uh, first year, uh, he managed to just, uh, you know, come to the class, go to the library. He read everything he could read. I think after the session, they called him and advised him because I didn't see him the following year. Not that he changed department, not that he changed subject. I think uh, the old people called him and they talked heart to heart, age to age. And they advised him to go back and be teaching in the secondary school. And I think he saw that that advice was reasonable. It was too late for him. You see, there are people that take the challenge too late. Why we're talking about it today? When they should take up the challenge and say, yes, I'm going to go with it. They do not wake up at the right time. But I pray you'll wake up today in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Reading from verse 16. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Again, Paul here was talking to the Corinthian church. And in the Corinthian church, oh, you know, there were young people there. He didn't say, young people, I'm not addressing you. There were women in that church. He didn't say, you women, I excuse you. And there were men there, even new converts there. He didn't say, new converts, go to bed, go and sleep. This is not for your hearing. And then there were other people that were strong. He didn't call the strong and say, here is something for your personal, private uh, consumption. I'm telling you, be ye followers of me. No. Already he told them in the Corinthian church, you see your calling brethren, how that not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise according to the flesh are called. He has called the feeble, he has called the best things of the world, he has called the foolish to confound the mighty. To the foolish, to the base, to the people that were not of the iron constitution of Paul the Apostle, after they were born again, he now told all of them, Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. You can tell them that what we're considering today is not for an isolated class of people. It's not for the fortunate people that may be able to pick up the challenge. It's for all the believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 again, verse 1, chapter 11, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. Of course, he told them, 
he said that you are like babies i cannot speak to you as unto spiritual then paul that's all right excuse us he said no although you are being like babies although you are immature although you do not have the character that i expect a real developed matured christian to have yet i'm calling upon you not to remain the way you are not to stay at the level where you are in fact although the gap between paul and the corinthians the gap was very very wide he said hurry up join me here he said buck up and join me here he said run make an effort run faster and now come along with me here let's be united be ye followers of me even as i am also of christ which means then we cannot give an excuse and say i'm a new convert he said come on follow me you cannot say i'm just a lady there is nothing i can do he said i'm calling you hurry up and join me here and he said you cannot say i am immature i am underdeveloped i am underprivileged i do not have the constitution of all the apostles therefore have me excuse he said no come on join me here be ye followers of me and you know sometimes we'll come to a meeting like this and there are people that will excuse themselves in every serious thing we are talking about we come and we talk about uh, repentance and restitution who oh, he says i am not deep alive excuse me i cannot do that in our church you don't practice that and then we talk about a christian commitment consecration christian dressing who oh, says i'm happy i'm not one of these people i just came to their solution 96 i am not part of them have me excuse and we talk about commitment in the service of the lord who oh, said these deeper night people they are up to something they want to win the whole world in a, in a single session they want to just grab the whole campus and shake the campus and put the campus in the hand of christ these people it looks like if you follow the things they are saying you are not going to do any other thing only evangelism evangelism and then he will rest back and say thank god i'm not part of these people now i can sleep now i can do whatever i want to do now i can even go to the night club because after all i am a so so psychedelic christian and i'm not part of them you are part of what we are talking about i said you are part of what we are talking about and you know i will not be surprised at all if the last will become the first i will not be surprised at all if the lukewarm will be on fire for christ i will not be surprised at all if the people that have been arguing it is not for me it is not for me you are the people that will become the champion of this scene and the people that you are pointing to now you say you are deeper life you are deeper life later those people you call deeper life they will look at you and say ah when did you start this scene your own is even hotter than my own now because you are going to rise up yeah. you are going to wake up yeah. and this thing you say you have not been doing you are going to do it in jesus name yeah. Yeah, you know i've uh, uh, got surprises i've seen some surprising things when we were uh, in the campus uh, many many years ago some of you you were not even born at that time uh, you see at that time there were some people if I went to them and I share the gospel with them they will say get away with this thing we don't have any time for that now that one is too much and that one is too strict and uh, right now sometimes I come across some of them and those people they are on fire for Christ and it will happen to you like that the things you have been pushing aside and you said it is not for me you will come and tell us your testimony you will be a model you will be a standard god is going to use you in a mighty way in jesus name you say that's faith talk how do you know that will happen because it happened to that like paul the apostle he hated this thing he didn't want this thing he rejected it he persecuted the people that were even talking about christ and then Peter that had started long long before him when Paul came in Paul did more than Peter am I right more than John am I right more than the other people he had been saying they were fanatical he became fanatical to power three very very fanatical and he had the fire of God upon his life that's why I am full of hope and expectation that everyone here this day the fire of god will come upon you 
and the feed you yourself you have been criticizing and you have been pointing fanatical 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 i'm telling you people are going to point to you and they will say what happened to you just one week of conference so white we were among the people persecuting all these people before you turn around now i even saw those people were fanatical you are fanatical to power number five in jesus name and so here we are we're talking about paul the apostle you know his name changed because he was Saul. if you read uh, the new testament very well you read the acts of the apostles and you'll come across them Saul, 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 from a uh, chapter 7 of acts of the apostles up to chapter 13 of acts of the apostles after chapter 13 of the apostles you don't say uh, acts of the apostles you don't find Saul anymore chapter 7 chapter 8 chapter 9 chapter 12 then chapter 13 Saul Saul a little man I told you yesterday but then immediately he received that call of God and he launched out into that missionary journey and he got to that gentle field and then he began to manifest the authority and the power of the Lord nobody called him Saul anymore some people some people don't even know he had ever been so now is paul the apostle and today god is going to change you your name your life your nature your conviction the authority you have even your lifestyle everything i'm telling you that today as god changed Saul to paul we will not know you as weak anymore we will not know you as feeble anymore we will not know you as an inconsistent person anymore something new is beginning in your life and it is going to start today the fire of god will burn now talking about paul now you cannot talk about paul in five minutes do you know that if you are looking at your wristwatch when are we going to finish you think i'm talking about judas iscariot you think i'm talking about uh, you know Absalom? when you talk about paul get ready for long message are you ready yeah. you know sometimes it surprises me the students that go to the lab and they spend two hours three hours looking at that little thing and plotting the graph when they come to the church when i preach for 30 minutes they're looking at their wristwatch when they spend three hours in the lab they don't look at wristwatch when they come to the church and i'm spending 30 minutes and 45 minutes they're looking at the wristwatch if you have wristwatch i just remove it from your hand put it in your pocket and close your eyes because today the lord is going to do something in your life in jesus name because uh, you know when you talk about paul you are turned on and your life changes immediately now we're going to talk about three points but because i'm talking about paul the three points are actually six points you understand now that means i'll give you two things in point one i'll give you two things in point two and i'll give you two in point three what is uh, two times three oh i i thought you would know it because you know some history geography university students they don't know multiplication table now we're going to look at point number one point one we're looking at the conversion and call of paul the conversion and call of paul number two the conduct and consecration of paul the conduct and the consecration of paul point three conviction and commission of paul those are the things we're going to limit ourselves to today and uh, as we see this man please always bear in mind that we're looking at the life at the consecration at the service at the conviction everything concerning paul so that he will be a pattern a pattern unto us number one the conversion of paul then the call of paul if you are talking about the conversion you need to understand what he had been before what event took place in his life and what he became after the past the present and the afterward in acts chapter 9 from verse 1 and saul remember this between 7 and 13 in chapters he still saw and saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the lord went unto the high priest 
and desired of him letters to Damascus, to, to the synagogue, that if they found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. He was an injurious person. He was a persecutor. He hated Jesus Christ. He hated everything relating to Christ. He hated the word of the Lord. He hated Christianity. He hated Christ and everything coming from Christ. And now he made it almost his full-time job that he will go everywhere, whether in the synagogue or in the houses, anyone he found to be called a Christian. He will take that individual, bundle him, and take him to the prison. Such power he had, such authority he had, mixed with much hatred in his heart and life. He tells us himself in First Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer? Look at the tense. He didn't continue to be a blasphemer. But you see, when he was a sinner, he was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But that's a mark of conversion. I was this way, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He was a sinner, a terrible sinner. In fact, if you look at verse 15, this is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And so you will see here, he was the chief of sinners. A terrible sinner indeed. And yet you need to understand, at that time, he was still religious. Some people say, I don't understand why these people are just calling us to be born again, born again, born again. I go to church. I'm a serious, committed person in religion. Saul was like that as well. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, Touching the righteousness, self-righteousness of the Pharisees, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And so you will see that although he was religious, he was not righteous in the sense of being righteous by faith, being cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, being touched, transformed by the grace of God, and having the life purified and cleansed by faith in Christ. He wasn't righteous that way, but he was religious. And even though he was religious, he was still persecuting the church. He was a blasphemer. He was an injurious person. In fact, he said he was making profit in religion. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversation, my lifestyle, in time past, in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. He said, beyond measure. Even unbelievers thought he was going too far. The persecution was too much. He now said, beyond measure, I persecuted the church. In verse 14, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation. Being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. He was zealous of tradition. But he didn't have transformation. There are religious people that are zealous of tradition. And they will tell you, I am a Catholic. I stand for everything the Catholic stands for. Other people will say, I am an orthodox believer. And I stand for everything orthodoxy stands for. Other people will say, I was born in this other religion. And I stand for everything that religion stands for. And it, you may be very zealous in that religion, but there's no change of life. There is no transformation. There is hatred. There is wickedness. There is evil in the heart. It was like that with Saul of Tarsus. He tells us himself that he was 
an injurious, wicked, evil person. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22. Acts 22, reading from verse 5, from verse 3. I am very willing, a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward god as ye all are this day and i persecuted this way unto death unto the death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women do you realize that something is said there he said i persecuted this way he meant christ because christ is the way the truth and the life. Christ is the, listen, the way, truth, life. Join that together. Is the true way to life everlasting. And because of that, he and Christianity, what came out of him, is referred to as the way. And then he's the way into the kingdom. He is the way appointed by the Father. He is the way of holiness, of righteousness. And he is the way, the only way that leads into the kingdom of God, into the bosom of the Father. And they saw persecuted this way, even unto death. In verse 5, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. You will see then his past life. He continues to tell us in chapter 26, from verse 9, chapter 26, verse 9, I verily thought my, with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, contrary, opposed to the name of Jesus Christ, which thing also I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them of, of one in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. And so you see the life that Saul lived before he met the Lord, but thank God he met the Lord. And no matter how far you have gone, you will meet the Lord. Because you see, the Lord loves you. The salvation of Paul the Apostle should be an encouragement to every one of us. That no matter what you have done in the past, no matter what evil you have done in the past, no matter the persecution you have caused Christians in the past, I believe that the Lord will touch your life in Jesus' name. There is uh, April, that is this year, we had uh, Easter retreats here. And uh, the way things uh, happen here in Lagos is not the way it happens everywhere. Because it's not uh, easy to bring all our members for Easter retreat here in one session. So we had five sessions of um, Easter retreat. And in one of those uh, retreats, some people came from a particular district in Lagos. They, they invited a particular man. And this man, he didn't uh, know that anybody could even come and give him an invitation. Because he persecuted this church more than any other person in that community. And in fact, when I heard about him later, I wondered how you could have persecuted a church like that. Because he was even a blind man. Blind, yet he persecuted the church more than any other person. And uh, not only deep in life, anywhere you mention church, he was there to persecute. And then we had the Easter retreat. And the people from that community, they came here for their retreat. He didn't come. He couldn't have come. And uh, many, many things happened. The lame stood up and they were jumping and, you know, um, literally, literally, really jumping. And they're running around. And the blind people, their eyes opened. Many, many things happened. And then when the people went back to the uh, community, they started giving testimonies. What the Lord was doing. Then he called somebody, not a deeper life fellow. He said, this thing they are talking about, can you take me there? 
And so in the next uh, group, somebody uh, brought him here privately and secretly. And he stayed somewhere where the people, he thought the people in that area would not know him because he was uh, the chief persecutor, champion persecutor of the Christians. And our God is good. I said, our God is good. You know, that you would have thought that uh, if you were, if you were the person that uh, was distributing the healing and everything, if you said, I am here, I am here, you say, who are you? Go and stand by one side. Now you want healing. You have been persecuting us. When we serve the people that are good people, then we will come to you if it remains. But you know, the very day he came here, prayer was going on here, and the power of God touched him there, and his eyes got opened. And when his eyes uh, got opened, he looked at uh, the whole thing and saw beautiful people, the joy of the Lord. And then uh, he didn't come here to give his testimony, I don't know why, he went to their community. And he, he was going to the deeper life people one by one. He said, you know me? And he said, we will not know you. We know you. He said, will you forgive me? I am one of you now. If the Lord will do it for that man, the Lord will do it for you. Uh, so whatever you have said in the past, whatever you have done in the past, the grace of God is available for you. And if you call upon the Lord today, he will forgive all your sins in Jesus' name. Now look at our friend. Look at the model. Look at the standard. Look at the pattern before us in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 3. And as a journey, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. That light will come into your soul. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Lord, who art thou, Lord? And, he, and the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the priest. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But he was, they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there without sight, neither did eat nor drink. Now, after that experience happened to him, for three days he was just praying. He was just praying, Lord, I am sorry. Everything I've said, I don't know that you are God. I don't know that you are the Lord. I do not know that you are the Savior. I did not know that you are the expected Messiah. All those three days, he couldn't eat. He was praying. And the Lord remarked that he was praying. Look at verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, unto Ananias, Rise and go into the, into the street, which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he prayed. He repented, he prayed, he confessed, he wept, he cried, he felt sorry for all the things he had done. Oh Lord, I did it in ignorance. Have mercy upon me. I will serve you. Whatever you want me to do, that I will do. I've done the will of the devil in the past. Now I will do your will every minute of the rest of my life. Every moment of the rest of my life. I will do your will. Climbing the mountain, I will. Going down the valley, I will. In, on the sea, yes, I will. If it means walking in the forest, I will. Everywhere that I've said Jesus is not God, I'm going to go back there. I'm going to say Jesus is Lord. If you will say me if you will change my life everything will be turned around and the Lord said Ananias go to that man he will not eat three days and three nights he gave himself completely unto the Lord even though Ananias complained that I had of this man an injurious man he came into this place so he could persecute us and cast us into the prison the Lord said I have met him now I have changed him. I have transformed his life. He is no more an enemy. He is now a child of God. He is now your brother. Look at verse 17. And Ananias went his way. And he entered into the house. And putting his hand on him, he said, He said what? He said what? He said what? Brother Saul. Was he born again? Were the sins forgiven? Was he still an enemy of God? Was he still a persecutor? Was there conversion? 
Yes, brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and the field was the host. So you can see here a real conversion, a definite conversion took place. Was there evidence of that conversion? Because remember once again now, he is a model for us. He is a pattern for us. He is a challenge to every one of us. We have now seen there was conversion because he's called Brother Saul. Was there any evidence of that conversion? Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 22. And was unknown by faith unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. That's conversion. Is that not conversion? He which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once in the past he destroyed a change had taken place that's why he himself later said if any man be in christ he is a new creature all things are passed away behold all things are become new now you need to notice something about paul the apostle for many many people they get saved but they do not know they are called to service for many people, there is a wide gap between the time they were converted and the time they are called. For many, many people, there is a wide margin between the time of salvation and the time of service. For Paul the Apostle, you will realize that that was not like that. It was different. He was converted. He was called. He was converted immediately. He received the call of God. In Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Look at it from verse 14. And when we were all falling to the earth, I had a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is time for thee to kick against the priests. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. That was still before he knew the Lord. But the voice of the Lord was coming to him now. And the voice of the Lord called him to a change of life. Look at what follows immediately. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister, the call of God. To make thee a minister and a witness both of the things thou hast seen and of those things in the which i will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people and from the gentiles unto whom now i send thee to open their eyes to turn them from the path from the darkness unto light and from the power of satan unto god and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. He even heard about sanctification on that same day. He was converted. The Lord spoke to him about the call into the ministry and the Lord even told him there's something called sanctification at that time that he was being called. Now we have seen the conversion. And we have seen the call. I go to point number two. What's number two? Again. Conduct and consecration of Paul. Now, the conduct. When he became born again, when his life was changed, what was his lifestyle? Now, here is a place where we really need to understand he is a pattern. He is a model. He is the standard. He is someone we're looking at. And what happened to him, the Lord expects it will happen unto us. I want you to see now in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Reading from verse 20. The conduct of Paul the Apostle. After he came to know the Lord. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I. 
But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Here Paul the Apostle tells us about the change in his life. One, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Now you know the person talking. He was a man of self-will before. A stubborn person before. A rigid, rebellious fellow before. A person of strong determination before. A person that said, what I will do, I will do. No matter who suffers as a result of it, no matter who is happy or is not happy. He was a man that never bent for anyone. If he was going a particular way, he went that way, nobody could stop him. But he said, that I in me has been crucified with Christ. That's a change of life. You see, that I is the center of S-I-N, sin. And when you think of sin in a man, it is that rigid I that will not bend to the law of God. It is that straight, stubborn eye that will not bow to the will of God. When you think of a man, a man in sin, a man in evil, a man that doesn't recognize the authority of Christ, the dominion of Christ, the power of Christ, a man that does not possess the grace of God, he is full of eye. There is an eye standing within him. Anything he hears from the Bible, he shakes his head. The eye internally says, don't listen to them. Anything you counsel, anything you say, there is the eye within that says, they don't know me. And when anything happens, he says, hmm, hmm. the way you are touching me, the way you are teasing me, the way you are talking, if you allow the spirit of my father to come upon me, and I show you who I am, you will not only spell, uh, smell pepper, you will smell acid inside pepper. You see, that's the sinner. He has the eye within, standing firm, standing straight, rebellious, and stubborn. But then Paul the Apostle says, I'm born again now. I'm converted now. I'm not rebellious anymore. The eye in me has been crushed. And he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Nevertheless, I live. Now, you say, but you said, I was crucified. And I told you, I is the center of sin. S-I-N. But he still uses the word I. He says, nevertheless, I live. Now, listen. In the past, it was the I in sin. But now, this time, it is the I in him. H-I-N. Still at the center. The eye in sin had been crushed, had been cancelled, had been removed. But then, is there no eye anymore? Oh yes, there is still eye. The eye in him, in Christ. Because you see, when you are now in Christ, you abide in him. You rest in him. You walk in him. You live in him. You pray through him. Everything you do now is centered on him. It's not the I in Christ. I in him. It says, therefore, nevertheless, I live. Yet not really I. Not my old sinful self. Not my old selfish individual. Not my old criminal a kind of life yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by the faith of the son of god who loved me and he gave himself for me that's the conversion that's the change of life that is the transformation that has taken place and when you are really born again there will be that transformation also there will be that change in your life as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2. But I've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. That's a new life. You renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness. Paul the apostle said, my conduct is not different. Lifestyle now different. No more hypocrisy. Duplicity, 
pretense, fraud, magic, all the hidden things of dishonesty, occultic things, when you say hidden, occultic. But he says, we're no more walking in craftiness. We're not living dubious lives anymore. We're not living in any dangerous way anymore. Neither are we handling the word of God deceitfully. You will see then that life had become totally different. Not only that, he had straightened up the past. Acts chapter 24 and in verse 16. Acts 24 verse 16 and herein do I exercise myself, Paul talking, to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Oh yes, he said, I remember the people I offended. My conscience smacks for it. My conscience pricks me because of all the things I did before I knew the Lord. And what have I done? I've gone to those men. I've gone to those women. I've gone to those families. And I've straightened out everything that was wrong. So that I could have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. That's what the Lord is expecting from you. If you say now you are born again. If you say now, your life has been turned around in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, from verse 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, in deceit. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. That's the conduct of Paul when he was converted. A, a new change came upon him. He said, it is not to please the Sanhedrin anymore. It is not to please the council in Jerusalem anymore. It is not to please the Jewish religious people anymore. And my life is not supposed to be pleasing the Pharisees and the Sadducees anymore. Not as pleasing men. But God, we try our hearts. He realized that if you are born again, then your life will change. And you will not be saying, if I don't wear that thing, the boys will not appreciate me. Therefore, I need to wear that, those things so that uh, the boys, I will please those boys. You don't want to please any boy anymore, any man anymore, any lecturer anymore, or even your relatives or your people anymore, not as pleasing men. When you are truly converted, the only thing that matters to you, am I pleasing God? Am I in the will of God? Am I obeying the word of God? Or am I trying to do anything that will please any individual? In verse 5, for neither at any time used with flattering words as you know nor a cloak of covetousness god is witness nor of men sought we glory you see the conduct of uh, paul the apostle after he became born again after his life changed he said i am not seeking glory for man anymore and you know today as well when we're considering the area of dressing and you appear before the mirror and you're good enough and you're neat but then a thought comes to your mind if i go out like this how will the young people look at me do i look charming to them do i look acceptable to them do i look all right to them you see the unbeliever and the one that already he comes to the church or he is hearing the messages but there is no definite change he's not thinking about god he's not thinking about the word of god all he's thinking about is how does this appearance look to my classmates how will this appearance look to the people that are observing me? But Paul the Apostle said, When we gave our lives to the Lord, when I gave myself to the Lord, I was not seeking glory of men. Then he said, Neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been born in some as the apostles of Christ. So you see the life, the conduct of Paul the Apostle. He became born again. He was converted, he had a call of God, and his life was now to please the Lord and the Lord alone. In verse 10. That same chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians, verse 10. For we are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. He said, we behaved ourselves in an holy manner, just manner 
unblameable in the sight of all those people. In fact, it now goes beyond the conduct and it tells us the consecration. Conduct and consecration of Paul. Now see the consecration in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, reading from verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. That's consecration. Paul the apostle, when he came to his life changed, he had the call of God. Then he said, now I must pay the price. I must do what he wants me to do. I must give whatever it will take. I must please the Lord. I must satisfy the Lord. Then he looked at his life and there were some things in his life that meant profit, that meant gain, that meant the people of the world, the peer group in the world, to appreciate him. And he said, I can't keep all these things anymore. I can't hold on to those things anymore. If I'm going to please the Lord, my life must be fully given, sacrificed, consecrated, devoted unto the Lord. And so all things were gained unto me. Those I counted lost for Christ. But said, yes, doubtless. And I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but born, that I may win Christ. You see, that's the consecration of the real believer, the true believer. He wants to be able to push aside everything that will hinder his commitment unto the Lord. That man was a man of conviction. And the Lord gave him a great commission. That leads us now to the third point. The conviction and commission of Paul. Conviction. You see, the people that have no conviction, they don't get anything done in life. And as you look at Paul the Apostle, he traveled more than any other apostle. He was dedicated more than any other apostle. He preached more than any other apostle. He suffered more than any other in his own time. And he wrote more than any other in the New Testament. In fact, when you think about the gospel, and you think about the cardinal doctrines of the gospel, you have to go to the writings of Paul the apostle. The Lord gave it to him, gave him so much revelation. Why? Because he was a man that was sold out to the Lord. That said, I am going to go all the way with the Lord. He had a special commitment. Therefore, the Lord gave him a special commission. He had a special consecration. Therefore, the Lord gave him a special privilege. And if you want to be near the Lord today, and you really want to do something for the Lord in this generation, that people around you will never forget, that even people after you will still remember, like we're remembering what Paul has done today, then you have to be a man of conviction. A man that has received a great commission from the Lord and will not let go until everything is done. Now let's see that he had real conviction. The conviction that Christ planted in his heart. Uh, you know people that don't have conviction? They may be practicing this now and then they will say, well, I was practicing that when I was in the fellowship, in the campus fellowship. But now we are in the youth service and all these corpus around me, they don't believe the way I believe. And if I don't change a little, if I don't tilt a little, bend a little, everybody is going to be looking at me as if I'm queer. And I don't want to look as strange or fanatical. Therefore, they will change. Those are people with no backbone. Those are people that have straw as backbone. They are like uh, the amphibians. Neither here nor there. They are like the bats. They are not really among the birds and they are not really among uh, those, uh, the animals. And therefore, you really don't know where they stand. But Paul the Apostle was not a person like that. Anywhere he was, before Felix, before Festus, before Agrippa, before the other people, the Sanhedrin, whatever they were, he was going to take a stand. I pray God will make every one of us like that in Jesus' name. In uh, Galatians uh, chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? 
For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ, a man of conviction. He said, what do you think? You think I'm trying to please a man? You think I'm trying to dress to every tune? You think I'm trying to do something because the people are pushing me, putting pressure on me to do that? You think I am a servant of men? He said, if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. For I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not at a man. But for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He got it from the Lord, and he kept true and faithful to it as he got it from the Lord. He had conviction concerning Christ. He had conviction concerning God. He had conviction concerning the Holy Ghost. He had conviction concerning the word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse chapter 3, reading from verse 16. Here was the conviction he had. No wonder he did what he did. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's why he never made jest of any part of scripture. That's why he never tried to modify any part of scripture. That's why he never rejected any part of scripture saying, I will not allow the scripture to control me. He had conviction, strong conviction on the word of God. Sometimes I find a young people and they will get up and say, yes, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to take the country from the north to the south, all the campuses. We're going to take for Christ. But they do not have conviction on the word of God. They are wishy-washy. This doctrine comes today, they accept. Another one comes another time, they accept. And the people that do not have conviction, you cannot do much in the kingdom of God. I remember in my university days, and uh, some few years after I came out of the university, many, many kinds of doctrines were coming into this country. And uh, there were some of uh, the uh, students at that time, and some of the people that had passed out, and they will go to a particular university, the one I came out from, and then in the chapel there, they will come out, and they will be running around uh, the chapel there. And uh, after that, they will bend their head, uh, you know, at a particular angle, because uh, they had uh, from somewhere in America that if you do that, you are going to get revelation. And uh, some of them tried to come and talk to me. And they said, don't you know that a new thing is taking place? And if you join this thing, you are going to have power. And they talked a lot about a lot of things. In fact, some of them came to give me the books free of charge. They said, read this and it's going to really help. I said, I have the Bible, that's enough. And they were looking for power. And they did some foolish, foolish, foolish things. And they wanted me to join along with them. Although I was young, but I read the Bible. And I said, this word of God will be what I will stand upon. And I want to tell you now, I'm sorry for, you know, some of them, what happened to them. Some of them just died. Now, the reason why they died is because they were foolish. Because some of those uh, people, some books were going around then on the campuses, how to fast for 40 days. And some of them, you know, young people, they felt that they were told that if you do this, you are going to have it. And it had some great, great titles, great titles that a young person would like to just get into it and plug into it and get that power and do this and do that. And some of them tried it and fasted 40 days. But uh, the problem is that, uh, you know, some of them just lost their lives. And the other people did some other things. And they got into error, into false doctrine. In fact, there were some of them, when this thing came to them, they, some of them were in the third year, second year university, they abandoned university education. And I was uh, calling upon them, do it this way. They said, no, no, you are not consecrated. We are consecrated. Education doesn't matter again. I said, but Paul, the apostle, you did much in the New Testament. If he wasn't educated, he spoke Greek, he spoke Hebrews, and then he spoke Aramean language. Not only that, he wrote about half of the New Testament. You need education to be able to do the work of God. Oh, they say, no, God can do all things. Without education, we can do it all. They dropped out of school. Now they are nowhere to be found. But you are going to be reasonable. You will have conviction. It is the conviction standing upon the word of God that will help you now to go ahead and do exploits for the Lord. And as I look at you, I'm so happy. Because I know something has started already. 
and something great is going to happen not only in this country but in this continent in jesus name only we're still waiting we're still waiting because here we are in nigeria and those who have come from the other countries they're wondering you see now that uh, this is supposed to be an international kind of a uh, campus uh, congress and uh, we have more than twelve thousand, more than the twelve thousand we have here students lecturers professors and everybody we don't have up to 100 from outside nigeria i think uh, that is not balanced enough if you have more than 12,000 people and you have less than 100 i believe next year it must not be like that i said it must not be like that so that by the grace of god you too like paul the apostle you will do what the lord has called you to do in jesus name but he was a man of conviction he had the conviction that all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine he wasn't running away from doctrine if you are running away from doctrine you will never amount to a hill of beans in the in the, in the kingdom of god you will never amount to anything if you're a wishy-washy believer i don't want doctrine i don't want doctrine all i want is dancing you tell me anyone that all that he wants is dancing all he wants is fellowship all he wants is love he doesn't want to follow the syllabus when the professor is teaching he says well give us jokes entice us entertain us make us laugh all these equations we are writing all these formulas we are giving us we don't like them if you don't like them you'll never amount to anything in education and the same thing in the work of the lord if you don't want doctrine and if you are not really sound in doctrine you are not going to do anything in the kingdom it says is good is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness that the man of god maybe was the next word perfect perfect there are people that are running away from perfection they say no we don't want to talk about perfection we want to remain imperfect how are you going to perfect the saints when you remain imperfect that the man of god may be perfect totally punished unto all good works he had conviction but then he also had commission in acts chapter 26 acts chapter 26 reading from verse 19 Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. This man got the great commission, and he went on with it, and he did not allow anything to stop him. In fact, see what he said. First Corinthians chapter nine and verse sixteen. First Corinthians nine sixteen. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. This man, something drove him from within something was kicking him pricking him from within he couldn't sleep without dreaming about it he couldn't open his mouth without talking about it he couldn't open his eyes without seeing the unfinished work and the fields white ready for harvest he couldn't do anything without feeling the fire burning in his soul and he said even though i am preaching the gospel i have nothing to glory of necessity is laid upon me then he put a curse on himself he said am i trying to live without preaching the gospel am i trying to live a life of ease and not want you to preach the gospel am i wanting to go and rest somewhere and say i don't want conflict i don't want trouble uh, the harassment is too much he said do you think i'm a man like that yea woe is unto me if i preach not the gospel he said my food will not be palatable if i don't preach the gospel he said my soul my sleep will not be refreshing if i do not preach the gospel he said my life will not be satisfactory if i don't preach the gospel he said all the enjoyment and the pleasures things that will satisfy the flesh they will not bring any satisfaction to me if i do not preach the gospel he said friendship will be nothing to me if i do not preach the gospel he said opportunities will be nothing to me if i do not preach the gospel he said riches prosperity whatever will be a curse upon my life if i do not preach the gospel he said the only thing i'm alive the only thing i'm living for is for the preaching of the gospel yes i preach the gospel nothing to glory of necessity is laid upon me woe is unto me if i preach not the gospel i pray it will be like that with you that anywhere you are everywhere you are your thoughts your intention your desire your ambition 
your purpose in life, the thing that drives you, the thing that makes you feel like living, the thing that makes you feel like you are a man or you are a woman or you are what being called a Christian, is that you are preaching the gospel. And I pray you will preach the gospel in the day and in the night on the campus and in the city in the village and in the town at every opportunity before you pass out and after you are passed out during the youth service and after the youth service when your relatives are there when your relatives are not there before you get married and after you have got married for the rest of your life there is nothing else to do Paul the apostle has given us a pattern and it is to preach the gospel everywhere you find yourself if you travel out of the country you will preach the gospel if you remain here you will preach the gospel if you're among the blacks, you'll preach the gospel. If you're among the whites, you'll preach the gospel. If you go to the illiterates, you are going to preach the gospel. If you're among the educated people, you are going to preach the gospel. If you go among the doubters, you will preach the gospel. If you go among the religious people, you will preach the gospel. Every minute, every moment of your life, there is only one thing to do. Only one thing to do. It is to preach the gospel. Will you do it? I said, will you do it? That's what the Lord is telling you. And that's what Paul the Apostle himself is saying. Now eventually he came to the end of his life. And he had suffered much imprisonment in Caesarea, in Philippi. He had suffered imprisonment in Rome. He had got shipwreck. He had got a quite a lot of troubles and conflicts. And now he came to the end of his life as the aged apostle. And here is what he's not telling Timothy and what he's telling you. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2. Preach the word. He said, preach the word. You find yourself in the boat on the sea, preach the word. You find yourself in the airplane, preach the word. You find yourself in the vehicle, preach the word. You find yourself in the classroom, preach the word. You find yourself among people, preach the word. You find yourself in your building, preach the word. You find yourself among the people that will contradict everything you are saying, preach the word. The instant in season and out of season. When it is convenient, when it is not convenient. In the rainy season, in the dry season. In the joyful time, in the painful time. In the successful time, in the time of failure, in the times when everybody likes you, in the time when everybody does not like you, in season and out of season, reprove them, rebuke them, exhort with all authority and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own laws, they shall keep up to themselves teachers, adding each in ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch down in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of their ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a car of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love is appearing. The Paul the Apostle we are talking about is in heaven now, he's looking down. I believe he's talking to the Lord Jesus Christ, said, Lord Jesus. The population of the world is greater than when I was in the world. He said, Lord Jesus, the world is more educated than when I was in the world. He's telling the Lord Jesus, he says, Lord Jesus, the challenges are greater than when I was in the world. Is there anybody who can raise up like me today? And the Lord is looking down on this conference. He says, Paul, Paul, see that conference? The university people, educated like you are, philosophical like you are, logical like you are, legal like you are, and they mentally sharp like you are, if they will yield themselves, if they will commit themselves, if they will say, yes, we arise, we put our necks to the yoke, I can raise up Paul, I can raise up another Peter, I can raise up another John, I can raise up another Elijah, I can raise up another Elisha, where are the people today? Are you there? You want to be a Paul for Christ, you want to be a Peter for Christ, you want to be a John for Christ, you want to be somebody, 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 in the kingdom of God. You don't want to live a useless life, an inconsequential life, a life that means nothing to anybody on earth. You want to do something. You want to do something. You want to do something for the kingdom of God. Why don't you rise up and say, yes, Lord, here I am. Yes, Lord, where am I? Yes, Lord, here am I. Oh, Lord, but start with me. Jesus, begin with me. Who will go for you, Lord? Who will go for you, Lord? Here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. Send me, Lord, send me. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord that you will serve the Lord. That you will serve the Lord. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, 
all your intellect, all your talent, all your ability, all your skill, everything you have got, your energy, your youth, your life. Do something today. Do something in this generation. Time is going. Time is going. Time is going. You are becoming older. You are becoming older. Now while you are young. Now while you are energetic. Now while you are knowledgeable. Now while you are healthy. Now while you are sound. Now while you can see with your eyes. Now that you can walk anywhere. Now that you have the command of the language in your hand. Now, now, at this time of opportunity, rise up and do something. 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 This is the time. This is the time. Don't let the time pass you by. Don't let the opportunity pass you by. Do something. Do something. Do something. The unbelievers are waiting for you. Do something. The sinners are waiting for your message. Do something. The discouraged are waiting for you. Do something. Your campus is waiting for you. Do something for the Lord. For the Lord in this generation. Rise up and do something. Rise up and do something. Rise up and do something. That same grace that transforms Saul into Paul. That same grace is available. That same grace is available. Rise up and do something before it is too late. Thank <laughs> you. 